Hi. Hello. 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 The thing I love about portable mics is they work everywhere. People, 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 get ready. There are two, count them, two more people speaking. They're going to be pretty good. They're going to be pretty good. Uh, so find your way back to a seated position. Uh, put your tay trables in place. Um, you know, all that, you know, safety stuff. Um, do, 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 do. Give you a few minutes. Grab a beer if there's any left. Take it back to your seat with you. Grab a fruit platter. Eat some vegetables. Um, sort of give you a moment to find your places. Find your places. Um, so as you can see, uh, our next speaker is Jill Belli. Um, she, uh, her research, she's a researcher, but not like the researchers we had up here before. She's like a professor, assistant professor at uh, New York City College of Tech, CUNY. Uh, she, her research centers on utopian studies, which is really cool because that's, you know, what is the ultimate state of happiness? Utopia. Uh, you, and I, I won't do that again. Um, anyway, here she is. Okay, well, thank you everybody uh, for having me here today, especially to Craig for inviting me to speak with you and also to the entire IA community for welcoming me here, especially as somebody who doesn't work directly in the field, but who does think a lot about design and data and most especially about happiness and well-being. Um, although actually I do wanna say, uh, I was told this would make Abby very happy, that I realized actually during her talk that I do think I'm an information architect I was told you would do just that um, because, you know, I, let me tell you a little bit about my background. So I'm, I am an English professor and I work sort of at the intersection of a number of fields. I do work in utopian studies, which I'm going to tell you about in just a moment. Um, but I also work in writing studies, composition and rhetoric. Uh, I work in curriculum design and pedagogy and I work in the digital humanities. I, I actually co-direct um, our college's digital platform for teaching and learning and collaborating, the open lab. And so we actually do teach a lot of information architecture there and we work to design. And for me, um, that's really the connection that I see. It's all about designing, creating experiences, structuring uh, emotions, structuring information, structuring our desires. And that leads me to uh, utopian studies. So how many people here are familiar with utopia? Okay. <laughs> So a few, a few people, so I do work in utopian studies and it's actually a pretty big thriving interdisciplinary field that is thinking through what it means to um, have or create the conditions for the good life or the good society, to think about alternatives to the present, to think about possibility. Um, and actually, though in popular discourse, to be called utopian, if something or someone is labeled utopian, it's usually meant to be pejorative. Uh, often it's being used in politics. It's meant to mean that you're idealistic or that you're quixotic, that you're impractical, maybe you have your head's in the clouds. Um, or on the flip side, it, you, maybe you're somehow interested in totalitarian authority or that you're boring and uniform, stagnant perfection. Um, so I obviously think this is a little bit misguided. And I want to tell you... Uh, can you, yeah. So I wanted to just tell you a little bit um, about my conception of utopia. And the wonderful thing about utopia is that it actually allows us to think critically about uh, the world in which we live and our relationships, our relationships to ourselves, to others, to the environment, to society. It helps us to think critically about our desires, what we desire, when we desire, and the values behind those desires. It helps us to think about alternatives and possibilities. Um, and it really helps us to think in doing so about possibility to also reflect on the world in which we live and the people who we actually are. And so it's this gap between 
what could be, what might be, what should be, and what actually is, this tension between what is and what ought to be that actually is at the heart of utopian thinking and which gives it, I think, its critical power. So when I use it today, I want us to be thinking in that vein and to think about utopia's ability to help us to think analytically but also redemptively about the world in which we live. So it's not just to sort of point fingers and find fault, but also to think about how we might move not towards perfection, but towards something better, towards something else that might be. And so uh, that's just a little bit of background. Um, and Utopia, of course, is all about designing worlds, designing spaces, designing altered structures of feelings. And I think that that very much has connection to information architecture, which is also about building, making, designing, discovering. Um, so just to give you a little bit of more background, context, we've been hearing today about how context is all. So a little more context about my work um, beyond the fields I work in. My current project looks at the rhetoric and the pedagogy of happiness and well-being as it's played out in certain prominent discourses. So I look at self-help literature. I look at the discourse of positive psychology, which we heard Pamela talk about earlier. I'm actually really excited to come after. She gave a nice intro to that. Um, and I want to think about how the way we talk about these things actually matters, how it enables or precludes certain possibilities in the world. So um, what you're seeing here, I just want to give a quick shout out for this gorgeous illustration. I actually gave a talk um, last March in London, and it was on utopia and happiness. And uh, Penn Mendoza did a wonderful graphical recording of the talk that tried to capture some of the complexity. And that is what you're seeing here. So to move on to architecting happiness. So when I saw the theme of the conference, I was really excited, obviously, um, because this is something I think a great deal about. And we've all probably seen this ad, right? It's on the subway. And you're thinking about, like, what does it mean to have sustainable happiness? And when I was doing some you know, Googling around, I actually came across this website, architectinghappiness.org, which it seems like was developed um, for this World Information Architecture Day in Barcelona, some researchers who did a sub uh, survey, and they were asking some questions um, about, you know, what does it mean to have sort of a happy information architecture? And um, I do want to be thinking about that. I want to be thinking about what does or could, again, thinking about possibilities in the realm of the utopian, what does or could happy information architecture look like? Can we think about designing emotional experiencing structures, those feelings, just as we design other content? Um, and can we help people to navigate through those different effective domains? What um, do or could happy users look like? What do or could um, happy user experiences look like? What does happy data look like? What does um, happy tools and technology look like? But also, and this is what I really want to get at, what principles, what values are sort of behind these assumptions and goals? What kind of values support these efforts? And actually, you know, we talked a lot about happiness today, uh, and I know the world is talking about happiness today, but one of the things that I really want us to think about is, what actually is happiness? I know Pamela asked this question as well and um, took us through some possible iterations of that through user experience. But, um, and she you know, ended with a call for, I believe, happy first design. But I think before we can have happy first design, we have to say first, what is happiness, right? So what do we actually mean when we say the word happiness? I mean, it's an emotional state. She mentioned how it's internal, it's subjective. Um, it's dependent on context. Uh, so these are some really important things to think about when we talk about trying to design larger experiences for that. It's also an abstract concept, right? When I say I'm happy, we don't all necessarily mean, necessarily mean the same thing. We're not all referencing the same things in our head the same way where I might say I'm drinking a beer. P.S. I'm so happy to have the giving of this talk after we had drinks, which is super exciting. Um, but if I say, OK, close your eyes and picture beer, most of us can probably do that, some even better than others right now, right? But if I say picture happiness, it's actually not exactly the same thing. So we have to be really careful as we build policies and applications that put happiness as a primary objective to be understanding what actually are we promoting when we promote happy 
information architecture, happy schools, happy people, happy societies, happy businesses, happy users, happy customers, happy data, happy whatever, right? So what does that signify or mean? So there are just some other things to be thinking about it. And why does thinking critically about happiness matter? So another thing I want us to look at is what is the rhetoric and representation of happiness in various places? Um, and again, what values are behind these representations? So I've already mentioned that um, for me, I'm really interested in looking at a particular uh, discourse. And so I am looking at positive psychology, which I'm going to tell you about in just a moment a little bit more, uh, which is the science of happiness. And I'm really interested in that because it's one of the most visible and prolific generators of this rhetoric of, and of the values of happiness that we see today, and that informs a lot of the work that we do. Also want to think about assessing and designing happiness. So we might ask ourselves, right, how do you plan for or design or create happiness or the conditions for happiness at both individual or societal levels? Is happiness measurable? Well, I think a lot of the testing requires that we believe that to some degree it is. Uh, the quantified self-movement, which I'll talk about, and self-tracking and life logging, that also believes in the power of quantity and numbers. But if that's the case, how do we assess and how do we measure it? And then um, I think also really importantly, is there equal access to happiness or even the promise of happiness? And uh, this is something I want to consider seriously and come back to. When we evaluate happiness, I want us to think about, once we determine what happiness means, right, what does this tell us about what we should and then always should not implicitly, what we should not desire, what kinds of people should we and should we not be, what kinds of things should we or should we not value, and what types of actions or relationships or anything should we do based on whether or not it has that signifier of happy attached to it. And of course, who gets to decide what happiness should look like. And one of the things that I'm going to be arguing or suggesting today is at least within this presentation that um, the field of positive psychology has a lot of sort of control um, and influence over who gets to decide what is sort of the prevailing version of happiness. And then, and this might be maybe the most uh, controversial section, um, you know, is this actually something we should even desire, right? Like, is happiness something that is even good that we should move towards? Um, and if not, how might we imagine alternative visions or methods of happiness and well-being? How could we design alternative concepts and methodologies and tools and practices that take us towards something else that's perhaps equally good, perhaps better, but that has a whole different worldview associated with it? OK, so now we get some images, enough questions. So a few things to think about just to give you some context. Before I get into positive psychology, I just want to show you, I don't know if anybody saw last year in Brooklyn, this was, I think, last September, um, an artist, Kelly Kilford, who I believe was, well, he still is British, but he now is a New York-based artist. And he went around and he designed these street signs. And his thinking was that, you know, sort of the department of, I, I confess to not knowing exactly who has control over street signs, Department of Transportation or whatever it is, that they were sort of really affecting New Yorkers' um, sentiment and that he would go through and sort of replace or put up these positive street signs that would then um, provide a sense of positive affect and enable New Yorkers to be more happy. And with this, he also posited at the time um, that New York should also have a Department of Well-Being that would be thinking about not only making the world happier one street sign at a time, but the ways that cities and governments and politicians should be thinking not just about infrastructure, not just about sort of material things, but actually have be entering into the realm of effective domain that they should be making their citizens happier as well. And actually, this surprisingly, you know, there was a lot of news about it when it first happened and the street signs got taken down, but this became a thing. Uh, and actually, in October this past year, uh, in Newark, the signs were put up. He partnered with the mayor, and now there's um, a partnership to be thinking about that. But I think what this relies on, and I don't want to comment too much on that project, I don't know a great deal about it, but there's kind of two different ways of thinking about happiness. So one of them is sort of the, if you think positive things, positive things will happen, right? That you should just sort of think your way into a 
a happy state, that fake it till you make it kind of thing. And I don't know, do some of you recognize Stuart Smalley, right, from Saturday Night Live? So he used to stand in front of the mirror and do his daily affirmations. And this actually, um, you know, since I do look at self-help, I'm not going to talk too much about it today. But The Secret, is anybody familiar with Rhonda Burns? The Secret, it's a franchise and a movie and lots and lots of books. Anyway, The Secret, I'm going to ruin it for you, is the idea that thoughts become things. And so if you think something, it will manifest, um, which at its core actually has a lot of, I think, impact and good impact, the idea that you can have visualization, that you have some control over what may happen to you, but can get down a, a slippery slope quite fast in terms of a blaming the victim mentality, because if thoughts become things, you bring the good upon you, but when things are not so great, you also are the responsible person for that. And so the question about, you know, there's been lots of critiques of just positive thinking, that it's not just enough. Um, Self-help is primarily ridiculed for being individualistic, for being decontextualized, for being quick fixes, for being conservative, um, for being, again, really ignoring sort of social problems and focusing on the individual as victim. And so we are starting to stem away from using self-help in that sense and moving on to something called positive psychology. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, positive psychology is a relatively recent field that came into existence in 1999 when the then president of the APA, the American Psychological Association, Martin Seligman, who I would say is the founder and also the most popular proponent of this movement, Um, He decided that uh, psychology was no longer going to focus on remediating people who were abnormal or deficient. They were going to focus on flourishing for all. And this kind of put in a sea change of ways we think about it. And since then, as you can see, I mean, there's a new book that comes out practically every day on this. Um, And the idea of, you know, progress towards something happy, that happy is the telos that we move to. So you can be happy, right? But you can be happier. And guess what? You can be even happier, right, about this. Um, And Seligman himself, in 2002, he had this book, Authentic Happiness, which received a lot of criticism for being kind of reductive, too focused on positive emotions. And he, I would say we're kind of in the second wave of positive psychology now, um, where uh, he came out in 2011 with a book called Flourish, which was a visionary new understanding of well-being um, that tries to think about a fuller account of well-being rather than just positive emotion. But there actually is quite a deal of overlap between the self-help and positive psychology movements. Something that I do just want to talk briefly about, I am going to get to a case study of digital happiness, which hopefully will be pretty relevant for what we talked about here today. But I do want to look specifically at one particular application of positive psychology. It's called positive education. And it is the application of positive psychology tools and methodologies and values to educational contexts. And this can be K to 12 and and higher education, or it actually can be in less traditionally formal academic settings. Um, There's even a positive psychology curriculum in the military, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. And I'm not going to read all these quotes. I'm just going to throw some things up here to give you a sense of the rhetoric. But this is an idea that positive education right, is something not that it could make people happy, but this is something that schools should be doing at every level, that this is the responsibility of educators to teach for well-being. And so this is really a big shift in how we're thinking about it. And just to show you a few things, I'm going to flip through these quickly, but um, there's many instances of uh, of positive psychology taking place in colleges. Um, Back in the 2000s, Tal Ben-Shahar, who wrote those Happier, Even Happier books, uh, taught a class at Harvard that got a lot of popularity. And more recently, their student happiness clubs forming at colleges. Um, We actually are ranking colleges now according to the happiest colleges. Positive psychology also generates quite a bit of interest and funding. Angela Duckworth, who was just um, awarded a MacArthur Genius Award uh, for her work in GRIT, which is part of the positive education movement. And one of the things I want to think about is that positive psychology positions itself as something that is meant to be activist and that is meant to be for the public good. It's meant to contribute to building both the good person and the good society. And so um, is happiness, or the positive psychology vision of happiness, a public service as they claim? Positive psychology does have this idea 
Um, it's called PERMA 51, that by 2051, 51% of the population will be flourishing. And people always ask me, well, if you could choose, right, why would you just pick 51% to flourish? Right, that's kind of the corporate uh, stakeholder um, share, how you own things. But uh, this is kind of their mission to um, spread flourishing massively. And just one thing I do want to point out is that you can see that positive education is actually the vehicle by which this is meant to happen. Okay, so I just want to sort of layer a few things on top of this here. And so positive education, as I said, is an application. And one of the questions we might want to ask, so Penn, University of Pennsylvania, which is where Seligman is based, has an, a Master of Applied Positive Psychology. And one of the questions I want to ask is applied right to what and to who? And in whose interest are we applying these things? So I mentioned before that one facet of positive education is this program called Comprehensive Soldier and Family Fitness II, I believe now. It used to be called just Comprehensive Soldier Fitness, which is an application of positive psychology to the military. Um, and there's some questions about whether or not this should be happening. Um, and I am not going to go too far into it. I just wanted to say that one of the components, you can see the five components up there, is spiritual fitness. And there's been a lot of controversy over this because um, the Military Religious Freedom Foundation was saying, well, you, you can't, right, just be testing people for spiritual fitness and then determining what kind of um, data you're tracking on them and what kind of promotions you're giving them. And their answer is, well, we mean uh, spiritual fitness in some type of spiritual sense, not in type of any religious test. But actually, what people find um, is that if you take this spiritual fitness module, honestly, soldiers found that you actually cannot pass, right? And you can, if you're an atheist, you cannot pass. And so there's questions again about what kind of implicit values are these systems endorsing and why should we care? Because both positive psychologists and the military have made it clear that they intend for this to be something that will go more mainstream and that will inform other areas of our life. And um, also, as Pamela said earlier, in Bhutan, uh, they've been influencing a lot of uh, political movement. There's rethinking on the economic side of GDP um, to have a fuller understanding of prosperity and growth. And there's a lot of thinking about politically how we can incorporate these things more recently in urban design, how we might design cities for happiness, and then also sort of location-based. Okay. That was a little bit longer than I wanted to go, but I wanted you to sort of grasp this. And then before we move on to the digital happiness case study, I just want to show you one other really, really important thing about their rhetoric. So the first is that positive psychology aggressively, aggressively distance itself, distances itself from self-help. Okay, And they do this based on two claims. One based on the fact that they are empirically sound and scientifically proven, okay, and on the fact that they are descriptive, that they're merely describing phenomenon rather than being prescriptive or suggesting what we might do. Therefore, right, that it is valueless, that it's ideologically neutral. Um, and this actually, this happiness formula was an early version of what Pamela was describing before with the 10% and all of that stuff. Um, and then we also see, and this is the current, um, theory, prevailing theory of well-being, which uh, does sort of correspond slightly to the five building blocks that Pamela had mentioned, um, PERMA, positive emotions, engagement, positive relationships, meaning and accomplishment. And again, as you can see, they are believable because of the underlying science and because it is grounded in careful science, right? So this claim that they have hard data and that this data can speak for itself and they're just sort of helping us to discover or find or navigate all of this information about well-being so that we can therefore become better people. I'm going to skip that. And then the other thing is why it's so important to think about what we actually mean when we talk about happiness is because happiness sort of has this aura of good around it, right? If something is happy, it is meant to be good. It is meant to be positive. It is meant to be desirable. And actually then you, it becomes unassailable, right? If something is happy, you can't really attack it. You can't really question it because it is unassailably good and positive and desirable. And so Sarah Ahmed, who wrote a fantastic book in 2010 called The Promise of Happiness, is actually you know, saying that it's not just that happiness exists out there and that we call certain things happy, that when we label something happy, right, that it actually becomes a generator of that happiness. And so that actually by calling something happy, it acquires value. It becomes desirable. 
and whether or not happiness is sort of should be a motivator or a proxy for other types of reward or value in our system. Okay, so that brings us to digital happiness, which is a term I'm using to sort of get a catch-all for the application of positive psychology discourse um, or methods and tools along with big data, um, methods of technologies, quantified self, crowdsourcing, sentiment analysis, information architecture, all of this. Where these two things collide is actually what I'm calling um, digital happiness. And one of the things I also just want to say, why I took you through that whole thing about positive psychology, positive education, is that positive computing, what I'm calling digital happiness, is meant to go beyond the slow progress in positive education to disseminate flourishing massively. So po these new digital happiness tools, they have an explicitly activist stance behind them. They're meant to help sort of the gospel of flourishing spread more widely than it could otherwise, along with the a sensible veneer of empiricism, scientists, uh, sorry, scientists, um, science, hard data, objectivity that we sort of associate with data with biological truth and um, associated things. And there's a lot to um, do. And so there, another thing that I'm not going to talk about, but I'd be happy to at some point if anybody's curious, is that I want to look at the tools themselves. But there's a whole sort of utopian rhetoric that gets put around these digital technologies as well. Um, so that in somehow um, you can use an app, and this app, the Hapathon app, I'm going to talk about more, to, quote, save the world, right? That's actually their goal. Um, what they do is they use a quantified self method. Um, instead of a GDP, they want to talk about a MEDP, where your data is valuable. So you track your own data, and then they match you up in a social community purpose to um, find charitable organizations that meet your needs in what they call a, quote, dating service for a purpose. Um, so this is a really interesting moment, which is a connection of sort of the really large-scale big data um, aspects of uh, digital technologies and sort of the individual personal self-tracking um, ideas of the quantified self and a way of sort of meshing them and thinking, can we collect data to create happy individuals that will then lead to the good society? Twitter's hedonometer, I don't know if folks are familiar with this, if you, you should check it out. If you're not, I'm going to talk more about this. Uh, you should check it out after the talk, I guess. Um, but it is uh, a meant to think more critically about well-being and to help us to understand it more fully. I will come back to an, an explanation of what this is. Um, there's Happier, which is a relatively recently launched social network to help you, quote, feel freaking awesome. I think that's the second use of freaking today, so that's probably a record. Um, there's even a happiness MOOC now, which shows us sort of just how mainstream this is. Um, and so some of the things I want to also think about are the quantified self. So a lot of this is dependent on the individual wanting to track their own data in order to gain greater knowledge about their self because for various reasons. One, they want to learn more about their patterns and habits. They want to gain more control over the chaos of information that may, fine, we've heard that word today a few times. They want to um, change their habits. They don't want to just gather data. They don't want to just interpret it. They want it to be actionable. They want to be able to use this data in order, in order to improve both themselves and perhaps the world around them. Um, and so this is something we're going to come back to. There's also a lot of work being done. This is the Penn World Wellbeing Project, which thinks about language analysis and, and happiness and emotions. Um, and so coming back to the ideas of happiness and utopia, just for a moment, um, Ruth Levitas, who is a very famous utopian scholar, sort of says that the, the core of utopia is the desire for being otherwise, um, and that this is definitely related to the context of human flourishing or happiness. And that also utopian accounts are contested, right? That it means that we have to decide that some vision of well-being is better than another and that we, we have to be working towards thinking about them. So one of the questions we might ask ourselves is what vision of well-being is put forward in these digital happiness initiatives? Um, I don't know if you guys saw this, but over the summer, British Airways tested out a happiness blanket, uh, which was meant to, um, while people were flying, it comes over them and it actually does something that I don't quite understand that uh, sort of maps their brain waves and it, it's, it displays the patterns of their brain waves on the blanket, um, which I don't believe serves any functional pur purpose. But the importance of visualizing our data, which people have talked about, um, to try to understand uh, jet lag more, more fully. 
um, and other things about being able to track emotion um, with Google Glass, uh, which, well, uh, was more relevant a little bit ago. Um, and one of the things I want to talk about is that the quantified self movement is actually really caught up in sort of conditions of the self with therapeutic culture, with self-help, which, as we know, can really focus on the individual that, okay, there's a problem, it must be with you, and you should work on yourself as the site of change rather, rather than thinking about larger structural inequalities that might be happening. Don't fix the world, right? Fix yourself. And I do think that there are some ways in which digital happiness is caught up in this. So um, another thing, again, with the happy apps is that people, as we see Mickey McGee um, about a decade ago now is talking about self-help and talking about how people want then to fix at the individual level things that are social, economic, and political important um, in origin. And also, uh, you know, thinking sort of on a Foucault vein that these data about ourselves can be used to understand ourselves, but can be also used to manage, to control, to classify, and to surveil people as well. And some of the critiques of positive psychology are along this vein, and they're also along the measures of reporting, the gathering of data. Pamela did talk about this with the subjectivity bias that you have. But another problem that's not always talked about is that happiness surveys tend to measure people's happiness with things as they are, right? So how happy are you right now? which is basically assessing your satisfaction with the status quo and then reifying it into data and then policy based on that. And we might ask ourselves, if we don't, we might be happy right now, I might be okay given the current circumstances, but what if we don't accept the current circumstances as given, right? Then what might we wanna measure? So these are important questions to think about. I'm just gonna skip a little bit through some of these things. Um, and to uh, move just because I want to get um, to a few things later on. One thing I wanted to get to the slide on purpose uh, was what you could see here, um, and this is again Ruth Levitas on Utopia, but thinking about um, that part of the utopian project is not to build good societies, although some people do that, but also to break down in what she calls sort of an archaeological method, to break down the rhetoric that we're seeing and to pull out what visions and values are implicit behind them. So here we have on one hand positive psychology saying, okay, okay, listen to us, we can make you happy, we're scientific, we're great, we're objective, right? And then you also have in other contexts the founder of positive psychology saying things like positive psychology called to me like the burning bush called to Moses, which, you know, I'm not going to comment on that, but is not... Um, necessarily invoking scientific or logical analysis as one of its main points of claims. And the other thing we want to think about is, and this is again for the social network happier, if we have a quest to paint the world happier, right, what this social network does is it asks people to aggregate happy moments, kind of like the 100 happy days thing that we saw before. And this is nothing new. Barbara Ann Kipfer had this book. I remember having it at a child, 14,000 Things to Be Happy About. And it was just a book of 14,000 things that she wrote that she was happy about. It was the best marketing scam ever. Um, but I think something changes, right? So we can aggregate all of our happy moments. But when we put them together into a network, right? They become operationalized in a way that they weren't before. So the fact that they can be shared, the fact that people are performing their best selves to others, the fact that... Um, that other people are going to be responding to it, it doesn't mean that it's any longer an individual's well-being, but that it's actually now put into a social network where things change. And that's something that I think is really important. Um, in the Q&A before, somebody said, I think, um, data trumps opinion, or opinion trumps, opinion trumps data. Whichever way it was, it was suggesting that the data, right, should have the ultimate goal, right? That is, if the data were neutral, that these things are something that can speak for themselves and can speak to some truths. And one of the things I think it's important to remember is that the way that we assemble this data, the way that we organize it, the past that we create through this information in order to make it discoverable, what we allow people to discover and find, what the data is to begin with, who decides what generates that data and where does it go and how do we visualize it. All of these are questions that have certain values, assumptions, and decisions behind them that imply certain worldviews world and then that get put into 
another real world cycle that may then get applied to another context, right? So thinking about the real world impact and asking the big questions about what do we do and what do we design for, I think we need to sort of think of this zoomed out picture about what is happening to our work when we create it, when we generate it, when we organize it, and then when we put it out for somebody to use. Okay. Um, so here's this uh, network called Hapify, which is something also that Pamela mentioned. I wish you were here. I'm talking about her a lot. Um, and again, here you see this rhetoric of scientifically designed, right? But another problem that we might think about is that this presumes, and this is Ahmed again, the transparency of self-feeling. So again, when you're asked how happy you are, that means that that is a neutral question, right? If I answer, am I happy, that means that I am good, I am desirable, I am happy, I am positive. If you answer negatively, then you're found in some way to be deficient, right? And so people actually tend to over-report, self-report happiness, especially in public network settings because they want to appear happier. The other problem I would say is that we have to think about how when we are talking about happiness and analyzing happiness in online public network spaces, that we're not actually measuring emotion. Right, that we're not actually measuring, is this person happy, are they sad? We're actually measuring people's online behavior and reporting of how they actually feel, the way they're performing themselves textually in online digital spaces. And I think that sometimes, um, I, there's interesting work being done on this, but sometimes that gets under-theorized about how all of these different aspects come together to drastically alter the way that emotion is conceptualized and circulates among people. Okay, the other thing is that a lot of these social networking sites um, or happy apps also encourage or kind of force you to share in some ways. I remember when I signed up for Happify and I chose the private track and they, when I clicked it, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna keep going. And they were like, wait, but are you sure? When you're social, you actually get so much more happiness and they kind of nudge you into this oversharing. So, I know that there's just a few minutes left, so I'm gonna skip some of this, um, although it's pretty interesting. And the other thing, <laughs> no, 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 I mean, I, I could talk about it forever because I'm so interested in this and I hope we'll continue the conversation elsewhere. Um, but the other thing I wanna think about, and this goes with sentiment analysis, and I am gonna just briefly, after this, jump to the hedonometer to show you how that works, is that there are some things, right, especially when we're trying to understand or analyze emotion from language, there are some things that cannot be captured, right? There are some things that are left over, whether this is a cultural surplus or William Carlos Williams, I love his line, now I am not what I was when the word was forming to say what I am. That language can never quite keep up, right, with what our emotions are and so that there's always this lag. So if we're measuring or quantifying happiness and emotion based on what we're actually saying, in online spaces, and if that cannot capture the whole of uh, human emotion or human experience, what is actually happening to the metrics that we are devising and then basing our work on? This is actually also a really interesting case study. I don't know if folks saw this in the Times uh, recently, which was about um, when women become men at Wellesley which was thinking about um, a really fascinating article about what happens to the fate of women's colleges uh, in the age of sort of trans students and questions about whether students can be admitted if they were biologically or legally a woman when they were born or if they transition over. And so part of the problem with biometric data and self-tracking and life logging is that you're actually relying on the objective truth. When you track your body's data, people somehow think that is more true than what I perceive through my senses, right? Because it's not being filtered, it's coming right from my body. But what happens when biology itself, when your body is fluid, when it's changing? So I don't wanna think about data as static or neutral or objective, but to think about it in this fluid form, what quantified self-researcher Deborah Lupton calls data assemblages, and that they're always sort of imbued with cultural and social and political meaning as they move, and so that as we work to interpret them, there's all of these changing aspects that are going for it. Okay, super quickly, the hedonometer. So the hedonometer tracks emotions across Twitter. 
Um, and so there's all sorts of really interesting questions that come up here. And it's based on the corpus, was based on four things, Google Books, movie something, I'm forgetting at the moment because I'm running out of time. And what they did was they assembled a corpus of words, then they asked people through Amazon Mechanical Turk to rate them on a scale of one to nine of positive affect. And then they aggregated all these tweets, they take a sample and they have this sort of time scale which is interactive, you can go check it out, about what actually is happening and what days are, um, are sadder or happier than others. So actually you can see here, I don't know if you can see, but here's some of the happiness ranked. So the happiest words are happiness, laughter, love, some of the most uh, least happy words are here. And the question again becomes, well, who is going to define it, right? What words are in the corpus? What words are not in the corpus? Um, what are we thinking about why, right? Why these days are sadder? There was one where Justin Bieber's arrest was the cause of like one of the saddest days of all time. And so one of the things I want us to think about is what we are doing, right? Where we find happiness is doesn't just mean that it is valuable. It teaches us right, what we value, what we value, and determine is valuable rather than what is simply of value. So one of the interesting things is you can play around and check which words are in the corpus. So I was checking out utopian. So utopia is not in the corpus, right? So utopia in this system literally has no value. And so one of the things we might wanna ask ourselves is what does this mean, right, when we're sort of producing visions of happiness based on this? Now, uh, to their fairness, uh, the, the researchers who are at the University of Vermont are super, very nuanced and smart about their discussion of this. They understand that it's not representative demographic. They understand that it is not a representative corpus. But the way it sort of gets picked up in popular discourse, right, is in this really reductive way of like, okay, let's go see what are the happiest and saddest places in New York based on Twitter's hedometer, not actually thinking about all of these nuances about what might get lost, who's not part of the corpus, who's deciding what these words mean, and what are the political, social, and cultural implications of them. And then we can construct, just as we can look at happiness maps, right, we can also think about data differently. We can put visual maps. This is the hate map, the total amount of homophobic tweets, right, in sort of a heat map across the states. And when you try to look at these things, you start to see that when we talk about happiness, we're not just talking about something that is empirical or ideologically neutral or objective. What we're doing has discursive, social, political, economic capital. It has power, right, and that these things are not just scientific or data or informative enterprises, that they are moral and philosophical ones as well. So what I'll end by just saying that the question about whether or not you should or you, you must choose happiness, right, suggests that we are okay with the world in which we live, that what we should do is make ourselves the happiest, best people we can in relation to that. And one of the things we might wanna ask ourselves is, is misery sort of a more sane response to some of the conditions under which we live? And is it reasonable to think that we should endorse a politics of happiness or happy anything as being sort of the telos towards which we should move? So I do wanna just end by saying that I am not against happiness. I feel like I have to say that um, because, you know, I was sitting on the subway one day and I was thinking about this. I think I was coming back from a meeting with my dissertation advisor at the time, talking critically about happiness. And I saw this man on the subway, it was super late at night, and he was reading this book, Well-Being for Dummies. And I really thought, well, this is something that people want, right? That the world sort of needs more well-being and more positivity in itself. We need the world to become a better place. And so well, how can we think redemptively about it? How can we assume, well, maybe happiness isn't the ultimate telos. What else might become in its place? Something we can look for. How can we teach to sort of problematize and critically think through what happiness might or could mean? And also to enact a utopian refusal, which is to say that the conditions and emotions and sort of rhetoric under which we live might not be enough to not just say that there is no alternative to happy, but that we might think through alternative visions of happy. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Or you guys want more beer? Hello. Paul. Oh. Hi, 
Hi. Thanks for that talk. That was awesome. Uh, and welcome to being an information architect. That's pretty Thank cool, you. too. Um, I was wondering, are you happy? Like, is studying happiness affecting on one's personal happiness? I know that that's kind of a, that's probably a question you get asked a lot, but um, I'm wondering what your thought. I smile a lot. People think I'm really happy. In my department, I'm known as the person who studies utopian happiness. And I'm like, but wait, I study dystopia and unhappiness. Um, but I, I think that um, I am, I don't know that those are terms under which I guess I would want to assess myself. I am an in, definitely a hopeful and idealistic person. I do think that there are, is a lot of good in the world and that there's a lot of possibilities. Um, and I think that uh, part of being an academic, it's endemic to academics, that you are critical and you sort of judge everything. And it is hard to sort of think about things in a not super analytic way. And that's actually why I like working sort of in uh, digital design and pedagogy and making things because you're actually kind of an utopia because you're building things back up rather than sort of breaking them down all the time. Um, but certainly, uh, I think a lot of people read this happiness research and get super into it and become much more happy. And I will say, I read the happiness project, Gretchen Rubin. I don't know if anybody's read it. I did it. I cleaned out my closets. I got excited. Like, I, I do this. I read self-help. I get super excited. But at the same time, I think it's an important discourse that has real world effects that we need to pay attention to, so. Hi, um, Hi. thank you so much for like unloading tons more books for all of us to read. Um, but but um, I wanted to know what cross-disciplinary stuff that you've found has helped you the most or has that surprised you the most? Because you're you're taking a, psych a very internal to psychology way and I mean, something that I didn't know anything about, but um, I wondered what other disciplines have you discovered in this process? So, are you asking me besides psychology? Is that? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, I, I actually, it's interesting that I read so much psychology because I'm not a psychologist and I, I'm not really interested in actually even whether the methods work or not or statistics or um, the things that, statistics about the happiness that they report. I, I think that my intervention and where I like to come at it is actually to bring the disciplinary frameworks and tools and methodologies from utopian studies, from the humanities and digital humanities, from education and pedagogy, from critical pedagogy to bear on these things. So the idea about um, sort of thinking about whether or not we can see what is behind these things to understand the rhetoric. So that's coming from the, the field of rhetoric um, to understand what we can break down, but then build back up in light of other theories of social justice, of different types of militant optimism and hope from utopian theories. So I would say that positive psychology is the text that I'm looking at, but the disciplinary frameworks and lenses are coming from utopian studies, rhetoric, uh, digital humanities and critical pedagogy. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, Peter. I, I really like the one oh, had a bit about there, like, be careful that trying to be happy doesn't make you happy with the status quo and that there actually are actual things that are broken. Mm -hmm. And that's that was a good note. And I, I just wonder if anyone is maybe the two or three hundred books you showed up in rapid succession there covers that. But if if is anyone sort of trying to track that aspect of it? Is like how do you be happy but still keep in the in the fight and keep trying to make things better and be happy? Yeah, that's actually a really a really great question. So there's a number of people working. Um, at the intersections of fields, but in FX studies. So um, the person that I mentioned, Sarah Ahmed, uh, who is really fantastic in her book, The Promise of Happiness, does talk about, she's the one that were the quotes about happiness not necessarily needing to be the telos. And she talks about different types of marginalized people. So she talks about the feminist and um, people of different, uh, so queer, people who uh, present themselves as queer, people who are um, traditionally marginalized groups as representing a challenge to happiness. Um, she talks about the feminist killjoy and how that might actually be a productive space. Uh, there's Lauren Berlant talks a lot, her book Cruel Optimism, about how these 
idea is that when you are trying to reach for something and you're promised that and you don't actually meet that, then that actually causes some type of um, tension or disappointment that then can lead you towards something else. Uh, there's a woman whose name I can't pronounce, Depression of Public Feeling, and they talk about depression groups, all these people in affect studies who talk about other subjectivities depressed, uh, politically unhappy, how these can be generative and used positively for affecting um, different types of political and social change. So, thanks. All right, thank you very much.